little on this side, Lord, we just pray that you would be with him. And Lord God, the doctors and nurses in his care. Father, we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. We appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you for coming. If you're visiting with us tonight, we appreciate you coming and being with us if you would. Uh, there's a visitor's card in the view or a chair right in front of you. If you don't mind filling that out, putting it in the offering plate in just a moment, we appreciate the director for being here with us tonight. Uh, we thank you for uh, always uh, we always appreciate our visitors coming. Amen. And uh, we want you to know that uh, we do appreciate you. Uh, just a couple of things reminding you that uh, Christmas is right around the corner. Uh, getting very close. And uh, it's hard to believe uh, that we have balloon flew at Mont Speed through 2017. Amen. And uh, about to embark upon 2018. And I always remind you about this time of year that start thinking about what it is that you're going to do in the morning. Uh, in the following year, which would be 2018 for us, uh, you know, are you going to set some goals on reading the Word of God? Are you going to set some goals for, uh, for soul winning? Are you going to set goals for giving? Are you going to, you know, the truth is, if you don't set anything, any goal, uh, you won't attain anything. And so if you set some goals out and say, look, I'm going to try to do this, I'm going to try to give out uh, this many cracks this year, I'm going to try to, you know, then uh, you're more likely to do something. Right. And uh, it's important to be busy uh, about the Lord's work. Uh, also, um, uh, continue to pray for the lady. He is in the hospital is uh, having uh, issues with the heart. And uh, uh, so, uh, be in prayer for him. Also, Father Pat uh, is a heart transplant patient. And he uh, is also having issues. So, continue to pray for him. Uh, then, Brother uh, Joe was here this morning, sat on the back row back there. He um, works out of town a lot, uh, lives right back here in the neighborhood. So, uh, he told me this morning, came in, and uh, they diagnosed his, uh, his son, Josiah, with the key. Oh, and, uh, my. And, uh, he's already had one bone marrow transplant that they rejected. And uh, they were able to use his, this time they used uh, his dad's uh, bone marrow, it's only 50% match. Mm. They said with the drugs and all that, they could help it along. And uh, so, uh, if you would be in prayer for him, um, uh, his just son. And then, uh, uh, it, it seems like there's just people coming uh, pretty regularly now, having some issues. And so, uh, it's, it's good to pray one for another. We have uh, several folks here this morning that are hurting, and uh, some of them. Pain uh, emotionally as well, and uh, you know, it's, it's always good to come to the house of God for prayer. Amen. You don't know who you're going to be dealing with, right? And you don't know what uh, the folks that are coming are dealing with, and so uh, it's always good to uh, be uh, uh, submissive to the Holy Spirit. And you, know, you walk up to somebody and you just feel like with them. You know, they need prayer. It's okay to say, hey, can we go ahead and pray? Um, that's what, you know, they could be laughing and talking and all that. If you feel that the Spirit, Holy Spirit says, can, can we just pray together? Uh, most, nobody usually will uh, uh, refuse, especially in the house of God. Right. And, uh, so just, just be sensitive to that. Uh, I think you know, sometimes we fail. Uh, in, you know, we feel like we need to do something. Kind of like talking this morning. Uh, in the message, you know, we're making excuses, 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 excuses. Uh, sometimes we make excuses for why uh, we don't do what the Lord instructs us to do. And, uh, so let's be faithful in that, all right? Uh, do be in prayer for Brother Bradley and uh, his wife, Nita, uh, and son. We're here this morning. It's a good blessing to have them. Uh, a blessing to uh, thank you for to lunch and uh, to uh, sit down and visit with them. Uh, told uh, Michael on the way home, I said, you know, that was your mom's favorite thing to do, was to go out and meet missionaries after church. And, uh, of course, we went to Luna's, which kind of made it even more special, uh, because that's where we usually went. I uh, think my wife had something to do with a lot of that. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, uh, I even had the, the, the same thing we normally split. Uh, and uh, uh, it was kind of a uh, time of remembrance, I guess. It was a sweet time for fellowship, too. We were praying for him and uh, trying to get the school started there, or having the school started. Uh, having the school was great expense. And uh, it's uh, having to come up with a curriculum and all. Uh, it's a major, uh, major effort. Uh, so 
do be your prayer. Really cool. 
and he makes himself poor and rich. The world tells us one thing, God tells us another. You have to reject one of them. Who are you rejecting tonight? And you see the gospel. Elijah finally said, look past, uh, 
it's time for my evening offering, and y'all are just away. Get out, let me fix everything up so I can do that. Do my offering, and he said his, his offering in order, and uh, put it up on the, uh, on the wood. And, uh, then he said, you know, guys, you know, I, I realize we don't have a whole lot of water, uh, but I, I think I, I need to pour some water on this. And uh, you know, if you want something to burn up, you don't put water on it. Uh, I, I learned that. You know. uh, a few times I went to Boy Scouts, they told us, you know, uh, wet wood doesn't burn. And uh, so they took uh, 12 barrels of water and poured them up on the altar. And uh, he ran down and ran around in the little trench he dug there. And then he backed up and he says, Guys, you can probably don't want to get too close to this right here. You might want to back up a little bit here. And Elijah prayed. And fire came down and they dug the offering of the wood and the stones and the water. And people began to cry out, Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And uh, about that time, Jessica got a message that uh, Elijah had killed all the prophets of Baal. And she sent the message to Eli and said, uh, uh, Buddy, your days are not here. And of course, he fled and uh, went through a great trial. And uh, that just shows us that any time there's a great victory, it's going to be a trial fall. And uh, that was the case. And so uh, in Jesus' case, it was the same. It wasn't any different than the rest of us. Uh, he suffered in the flesh just like we suffered in the flesh. And then, of course, notice in verse number two, uh, the people came to hear the word of God. What a uh, blessing to, to, to read that, uh, that phrase. The people came to hear the word of God. And not only did the people come to hear the word of God, but there was a great multitude of people that came to hear the word of God. And verse number two says, and uh, saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would cast out or thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had uh, left speaking or finished speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Uh, that if you're not a fisherman, that means uh, cast out, we're going to go fishing. And uh, for a draught, that means we're going we're to catch a lot of fish out here uh, with these nets. So get ready for it. And of course, Simon has a response there. And he's answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Have you ever gone fishing and caught nothing? That's me. Every time I go out fishing to catch fish fish, uh, I always come back empty handed. I can throw out there, I can drown more worm and more minnow and lose more bait. But I never come back with anything. Funny thing is, somebody on this side can be catching fish, somebody on this side can be catching fish, and we can swap places, and I'm not going to catch anything. I just don't hold my mouth the right way. And I feel like that uh, I can kind of relate. I'm a Peter here. We, we've toiled all night long. And we call them. Notice what he says, though, nevertheless, at thy word, at thy word, I will let down the net. And it's amazing that Simon Peter said, God, we just don't, we, we've done this all night long. We're working on the nets now. We, you know, it's useless. It's the wrong time of day to go fishing. Uh, but since you said to do it, we're going to do it. Would to God that God's people would just say, Lord, I know what you asked me to do, and I know that in my pea brain, it's not going to be accomplished. <coughs> Nevertheless, if I were, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto the, their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, and they began to sing. Now, when Jesus tells you something, you can rest assured that you're going to take a big harvest. If it's done in his work. Notice verse number 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at the feet of Jesus, or Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him. 
hath a draught of the fishes which he had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were uh, partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt uh, catch fish, or catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook and followed him. And it came to pass, while he was in the certain city, to hold a man full of leprosy. And it goes on and tells that story. But I want to uh, look at verse number 10 of that phrase, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you this evening, Lord, we, we pray that you give us, Lord, the, uh, the truths that you want us to have tonight. Lord, you speak to our hearts, that you encourage us, that you would, uh, Lord, uh, bless, Lord, the, the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Lord, we are about to close out a, a year, and we're about to embark upon a new year. new year that hasn't been lived yet. We haven't even uh, set the clock to January the 1st yet. We've not crossed over into that into that time period. We have a brand new year. We have a brand new slate. Lord, rather than making resolutions of things that we don't intend to do, help us, Lord, to make commitments, Lord, to you for things that we will do according to your word. Father, I just pray that you bless the message again tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at the word of God tonight, as we uh, uh, think about what it is that Jesus is teaching here, we look in uh, Matthew chapter number 4. In Matthew chapter 4, we have the same story. Jesus has been in the wilderness. He's been tempted of, of, uh, of Satan, and he's now come victorious uh, out, of the, uh, out of the wilderness. And the first thing he does is he comes out and uh, he begins to preach the word of God. Now, uh, notice in verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 4, uh, it says that Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon and called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting the net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship uh, and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Notice uh, a couple of things here in the message or in the, in the word of Jesus in this passage as we see. He said in verse number 19, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus said in Luke, Luke uh, said that Jesus said that you shall catch men. Okay? Now, there's a response here in Matthew 4 uh, that I want you to notice. There's two times that it makes this statement. Notice in verse 20 of uh, Peter and Andrew, it says, And straightway uh, left their net. Straightway means immediately. That's probably the, the uh, British way of saying immediately, straightway. You know, we, the hotel, we've had some, uh, some guys from Britain uh, staying with us, and it's been, been interesting listening to them talk. Uh, sometimes you can understand them, and sometimes you can't. <laughs> but uh, it's been interesting because they use different terminologies. And uh, uh, one of them came to me one day, and, uh, and he said, uh, uh, what does it mean to honk? That's an open-ended question. I mean, I don't know. I didn't know if he saw a, 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 a bumper sticker on the back of somebody's car that says, you know, honk if you love Jesus, you know, or honk if you uh, support Trump or, you know, something. I mean, I didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, uh, so I, I gave him the definition of honk blowing your horn. You know, he said, oh, no. He said, no, no. He said, uh, what does it mean to honk if somebody he said, let me see if I can re reword that. He said, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I said, well, it depends on whatever your town you're in. <laughs> and who's in front of you? If you're honking at somebody, you know, then, uh, and you honk at them, then they're not moving. Uh, they might take offense to that. I said, in Texas? He said, oh, yeah, we are in Texas. I said, they might pull out a gun. Uh, and you wish you hadn't honked. I said, you, you know, no, he, he was talking about flashing your lights at somebody, flashing your lights. What does it mean to flash your lights? 
And, uh, you know, so we were talking, you know, about that. Well, you know, honestly, what we need to understand is that Simon Peter and Andrew, brothers themselves, straightway left their nets. Immediately at the call of Jesus, left everything. Brother Kurt didn't know what I was preaching tonight. He, he, he made, the met, made the statement about the fact that, uh, uh, that they lost, Mary and Joseph lost what they lost in order to bring forth the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. Uh, you know, they left everything. They left their livelihood. They left their, their, you know, their boats. They left everything. To follow Jesus, and they did it immediately. They didn't wait and say, "Well, now Jesus, now uh, we know what you want us to do, and we're going to follow you." But let us go and, and, and put ships up for sale, sell them, and, and sell off the the tackle, and sell off all of this. And, uh, and when we get everything up done, we put our money into savings, then we'll come follow you. Because that's what most of the of the world will do. They will amass a, a, an amount. Say, "Well, now I've got to do this, 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 this." And then I will follow Jesus. No, you, you won't. You won't. Brother Jack uh, Francis, he was a missionary to the death that we support. Brother uh, uh, Bradley uh, knew him. Uh, his wife, Rothia, was dead. Brother uh, Jack Francis was not dead. But Brother Jack Francis worked for uh, uh, the uh, gas company. Uh, for, for many, many, I mean, all the way up to almost to, I mean, to retirement. I don't know about, we're talking less than a year from retirement. And God called him to go to, to uh, become a missionary to the death in the United States of America. Just a few months left to get full retirement. But God says, I, I want you now. And he left off. Uh, I'm not worried about the time. You see, that's what God is asking us to do. If you follow down a little later, it says they 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 found that Jesus went and he saw uh, two other brothers, the, uh, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and he said, follow me. He called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Immediately they responded. Immediately they said yes. Immediately they said, "We will do this." Remember, Jesus was talking to uh, to one young man, and he said, "Now he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, I will follow you." He said, "Well, you know, no." He said, "Let me go bury my dad. Let me go. Let me go bury my dad. Once I bury my dad, then I'll come back and I'll follow you." He said, "No, let the dead bury the dead." First of all, his dad wasn't even at the point of death. He was waiting, going to wait until his dad died. And when his dad died, he said, then I'll come and follow you. No, you cannot postpone God's service. When God calls you, you respond to God's service immediately. That is the, the problem in our churches today. And that's the problem uh, in, in our Christian lives today is when God instructs us, we know within our heart that God says, this is what I want you to do. And we back away from it and go, yeah, but... We're not going to serve God. We're not going to do what God wants us to do because we're still involved with doing our own thing. We're still involved going our own way, following our own path. And, and you cannot be in the ministry, you cannot be a child of God if you are not willing to leave it all and follow Him. You see, it's important to understand that God has a mandate for His children. You are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. An ambassador is a representative of a foreign country to another land. We have ambassadors from the United States that are, that are in foreign countries. They are representing, as diplomats, America to Israel and to France, and to Germany, and to other, uh, other nations around the world, Russia and all. I mean, we have ambassadors that are representatives there. Now, they, are, they, they live in those countries, but they are, not, they are not citizens of those countries. They are only ambassadors, they are only representatives. And you are a representative of heaven here on earth. You say, well, I've never been to heaven. Well, you've been fit for heaven. 
Once you got saved, heaven is your home. Songwriter said, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My home was laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I mean, you, this, this world is not your home. This world is temporary. Heaven is eternal. And the work that we do on, on earth for God is an eternal work. It is not a temporary work. I think sometimes we think, well, you know, it's just, it's just temporary. No, it's, 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 it's eternal. I was thinking today when uh, Brother uh, Brian had mentioned the, uh, uh, this morning that his wife had gone to Tennessee Temple University. Tennessee Temple University, uh, Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, at one point was a, 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 a place of, of, of great activity for the Lord. I mean, they had satellite churches all around that church, and I mean, they uh, it was huge. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the college was training uh, men uh, for the ministry and to be missionaries and, uh, and women to be uh, pastor's wives and to uh, be... Uh, Christian school teachers and missionary wives and all these things. I mean, it, it was it was filled with activity. I, I've been there uh, a couple of times in, in conferences and was amazed at what I saw, uh, the work that was going on there. Do you know it does not exist today? The work that Dr. Lee Robertson started, built upon the principles of the Word of God, or nothing anymore. But I was thinking about that this morning as, as he was saying that his wife had gone to Tennessee Temple University back in the day when Tennessee Temple University was a, excuse me, a great university, a great, great college for training God's people. I almost went there myself one time right out of high school. And, uh, and I was thinking, you know, I know so many different people that were influenced by Dr. Lee Robertson that are still going. Um, thinking about Miss Anita uh, Bradley, she's she's still going. She's still serving. Uh, Brother uh, Roy Carsalis, the pastor of uh, Liberty uh, Iglesia uh, Bautismo de uh, Libertad, there in Houston, uh, is a graduate of Tennessee Temple University. Uh, a number of, of others that I, that I know that are scattered around around the United States and in foreign countries as missionaries were influenced by the man who started that work years ago. Now the work is gone, but the legacy continues. You see, the effect that you and I have on those around us, we're going to be gone one of these days. We are. Brother Bradley asked me this afternoon how long I had been in the church. I said, well, I've been in the church for 46 years. I was associate pastor for 20 years. I said, I've been the pastor for 13. Hard to believe it's been that long. Well, then Weatherly has gone from the scene. He started this church in 1961 with the help of other men uh, and, and women. And uh, he started this church down the road, about, about three miles down uh, south of here. And, uh, and out in the middle of a cow pasture and there was nothing down Garth Road. I mean, you could actually get down Garth Road without traffic. <laughs> there wasn't even a red light when I first moved to Baytown after Baker Road. If you can believe that. Of course, Garth Road was a, a two-lane road and it was a very bad two-lane road. Amen. It was almost, almost like a cow tra trail. I mean, it was horrible. And since then, I mean, it's, it's become the, the, the center of Baytown. But he built that church up there up on Garth Road. And, and you know, 40, for 46 years, we were on that property. And it's amazing that, that the influence that the church had on numerous people. I still run into people that, that rode the buses. We ran 13 buses at one time. We had... A uh, high day of 589, I think 389, like on the buses at one time. And, I mean, we didn't have the facilities that we have here down there. They had old buses that were broken down in the back, and they put a petition in them and, and put little face heaters in, in the winter time, and and, and and that's where the Sunday school classes were. I mean, it it was a it was something. 
But the legacy of the Garth Road Baptist Church is still in Baytown. The, the legacy of Brother Ed Weatherly, the impact that he had on Baytown is, is still far reaching. I still run into people that, uh, you know, uh, mention the church and, oh, Garth Road Baptist Church, that's where Brother Ed Weatherly pastored. The older folks never knew that. Some of the younger ones that are now older, I, I say younger because I'm so old, but, uh, you know, I drove the bus back then. Brother, uh, Brother Roy, who I guess went out to thought I was going to pick on him. He used to ride the bus years ago. Did y'all ride the buses? Miss Vicky and Miss John Wayne rode the buses. Miss Cassie, uh, I don't know if y'all rode the buses, but I know Brother Miss Brother Sexton were very much involved in the bus ministry. Steve and Deb, uh, uh, Aaron Michael and I, you know, we, we all were involved somehow, some way with the bus ministry. And we keep running into people and finding people. I mean, I was up in, in Longview one time and getting gas and somebody was kind of walking, are you Brother Jim? I said, yeah, yeah, Brother Jim. He goes, uh, I used to ride, ride your bus. <laughs> <laughs> all the way to Longview? <laughs> I didn't take the bus that far. <laughs> if they ever made it around Baytown, I'm sure they wouldn't make it to Longview. But you see, there's always that influence. You see, when God calls us to do something, he, he empowers us to do it. But he expects from us to have an immediate response to the work he's called us to do. It's a lasting response. How many people do you talk to in a, in a regular basis? Maybe weekly or monthly or, or even within the year? People go, well, I used to go to church. I used to teach a Sunday school class. Why, well, there was a day I was a deacon in the church. I used to sing some of I, I used to, uh, I used to be in the choir. And I used to work on those old hot buses. But the response is used to. What's happened that, that we've lost the 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 uh, the zeal and the uh, and, and the and the love for the ministry for the work of God? That it comes to I, I used to do certain things rather than I'm doing those. I mentioned this morning that God said I'm the God of thy father Moses. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. I am that I am. I, I mean He is a, a living God. He's not a used to be God. He was not a, a God that, that, that existed at one time. He's self existent and he's always existed and he will always exist. He will always be God. And his work is going to continue, but we continue, or we don't continue in his work and we use the past tense. Well, I used to follow God. How many people have you talked to that said, I used to be saved? You know why they don't know if they're saved anymore or not? It's because they've left. They're not serving God. They're, they're back in the world. The response that God wants from us is an immediate response. Not only is it an immediate response, but secondly, it is, it is a response to be active in the work of God. To be active. You know, the Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John were active in fishing for fish. That was their activity. That's what they, they their job was. That was what they did every day. They got up every morning or maybe every night, I don't know, when they fished, but when they were out, I mean, that was their occupation. They did that every single day without fail. But on the day that they met Jesus, they, Jesus said, uh, uh, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets. Immediately left, they left their livelihood. Immediately they left everything to follow Jesus. It's an active response. We should follow Jesus actively. You know, it, it is so easy in our society to put God on the back burner and not be active. 
There's a lot of things going on. I mean, we spend a lot of time doing, doing a lot of different things. And a lot of that time is wasted. Hello? A lot of that time is wasted. You say, well, how is it wasted? Well, you know, honestly, sitting for three hours to watch a football game, but they don't win until the last few minutes of the game anyway. Right. You say, but you gotta, you got to see how they got there. Last three hours. What, what could you have done in that three hours for God? I'm not, I'm not saying it's a sin to sit down and watch a football game. I'm not saying it's a sin to sit down and watch a basketball game. I'm not saying it's a sin to go fishing. Brother Mark. But when we put all of that in front of service for God, that's wrong. If we know that God wants us to do something, we need to do it. We need to be active in that. We need to follow that response. We need to follow what God has asked us to do. You know, a lot of Christians think of God as their own form, maybe. I'm trying, I'm trying to think of a word there. You say, well, as a form? God? Yeah, because you want to do something. But you want, you know, but you know God wants you to do something else. You have a Sunday school class, you ought to be in your Sunday school class teaching. But the thorn comes when it, it, you want to do something outside of it that, and go, well, you know, it, it's okay if I don't go to church today because I want to do this. I want to go fishing. Or I want to go hunting. Or I want to, you know, and there's nothing wrong with fishing and there's nothing wrong with hunting. But if it's in the place of what you should be doing for God, then you should be doing what it is for God. Now, I'm not discounting that everybody needs a vacation. Believe me, everybody needs a vacation. You need to take some time away, but you should take time away every single month. Every other week. Oh, preacher, I'm just, you know, I'm just so, so, so tired. And, uh, I'm a preacher, I, I just can't teach that Sunday school class this week. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to go out and, and, and get some rest. We live in a stressful society, I think. But we don't need to lose sight of the fact that we have a ministry. And you can still serve God on your vacation. Sunday morning is church time. Sunday night is church time. Wednesday night is church time. But preacher, I'm on vacation. God's not on vacation. I traveled a lot last year, Mike and I did, different places for different reasons. And when we were gone at church times, we were in church. We would leave after the Sunday morning service here, and we would drive to make sure and, and leave in time to get to a church so we could be in church Sunday night. If we're away on Wednesday night, where are we at? We're in church. Why? Because that's the right thing to do. It, it's, it's important to be active in the ministry and in the work that God has called us to do. We need to be active. We need to be available. We need to be active. Right? We need to do. Number three, not only did you notice that they it was a it was an immediate response. It was an active response. But it was also a permanent response. You say, how do you know it was a permanent response? That remember when Peter, when Jesus died and 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 and, and, and they lost all hope and they all went back to fishing, yeah. But they didn't stay away long. Remember Peter said, I go fishing. <laughs> and the other said, I go with you. <laughs> but while they're out there fishing and they look out across the shore and there's Jesus sitting up, standing on the shore uh, cooking some fish. Remember? 
Our service for God ought to be a permanent. God's call is without repentance, he says in Romans. The call of God is without repentance. God doesn't call us in the ministry and give us a license to quit. There's, there, there's, there's no clause. You know, when you, when you work for a company, they, they want so many days uh, notice when you, when you decide to resign. You write a letter of resignation and you say, I, you know, I'm going to resign from this position and uh, I give, I'll give you my two weeks notice. God's call does not have a resignation clause in it. It doesn't. Pastors retire. You say, well, should pastors retire? Yes. There comes a time that the pastor really needs to retire. But that doesn't mean he has to stop the ministry. Brother uh, Skip Smith pastored uh, uh, Second Baptist Church in uh, uh, the Senate City for a number of years. Pam, uh, really has a cousin that comes here once in a while. Her husband, her dad, and family and all. They went to Second Baptist and then uh, they joined uh, over, but Skip went from there to, to uh, they merged with uh, uh, something Baptist Church in North Channel. I can't remember what the name of it is. But anyway, uh, uh, over on Uvalde, and Brother Skip, you know, they, they sold because the church, Second Baptist, was right in the middle of a Hispanic area, and, and this area, church was in a good area on Uvalde, and that church was dying, and their church was dying, so they merged, and Brother Skip was, and Brother Skip was retired from over there. Brother uh, Green, I think, is the pastor there now. But Brother Skip went to, went, he's still in ministry. I don't know how old Brother Skip look, is. He looks the same as he always looks, uh, has always looked to me, but uh, he's now in the second He's still still serving God. He turned on the radio every once in a while on KHCB uh, radio, and uh, you'll hear him uh, speaking on the radio. He, he's still active. He's retired, but he's still active. Why? Because he grew up in the in the era of time that pastors didn't retire; they just regrouped. They they went to, they did something for God. One of these days, I'm going to retire. Right. <laughs> so you're going, and can you tell us when that's going to be? I'm not going to give you the benefit. I don't know. I may be 99 years old, like Lee Robertson. I, you know, I don't know. But I, I, I doubt I will ever, quote unquote, retire. I may retire from pastoring, but I will continue. I have things that I want to do. I have, in, in ministry, I, I love to teach a Bible college. I mean, I, I, I would love to be an influence to other young men and other young ladies that, uh, that are coming up to say, hey, you know, you can do this and, and, and be an encouragement and a help and a strength to others. Uh, and, you know, I, I made that statement and Brother Sam Davidson was listening and his ears perked up and he goes, uh, uh, what are you retiring? <laughs> I said, not exactly, really. Not exactly. Number one, I don't want to move out of a home. There's, there's tornadoes there. But if that's God's will, I do. You see, it's a permanent work. God doesn't intend for us to stop working for Him simply because we got old. Because we had health issues. I remember the story so well of Dr. Uh, uh, David uh, Gibbs telling the story about his mother who had polio and she was in a wheelchair. Going up and down the streets of Chicago, filling up uh, city buses and bringing people to church. Well, I, I'm having a hard time walking. Yeah, I, I understand that. And when these cold fronts come through, man, I can tell you that they're coming. I ain't know what my grandma was talking about when she said, "Man, we got we got a we got a storm coming." Well, how do you know, Grandma? Well, I feel it in my bones. I understand now. You dumb bucks, you don't understand, but you only say you will understand about feeling that rheumatism in your in your bones. But that's not a reason to stop service. The only reason that we stop serving God is because we died for the Lord. That's it. I'm a
amazed at Dr. Lee Robertson going so spent so many years. Dr. Tom Malone going ninety something years. I mean, just active, going, 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 going. But the influence that they left is still here. They're still uh, multiplying exponentially because one man served God. The young man. You don't remember the name of the young man, of the man that led him to the Lord, but you know who D.L. Moody is. And that one man that was faithful in the Sunday school class and faithful to pray for his young men and faithful to go and witness to D.L. Moody and the, and the other students in the class and bring D.L. Moody to the Lord. I mean, that man, we may not remember his name, but God knows his name. His name may not be in the in the annals of uh, of uh, the the history books of of our day and time, but I guarantee you, there in God's history, right. it's with really that. You see, you can't ever stop without affecting somebody. One time, years and years and years ago, long before I moved to Facebook. I got really angry, not at God, but just the people in general. And I said, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do this anymore. And the Holy Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, Look, what about it? And started naming people in my life. What about something? What about something? What about something? If you quit, what's going to happen to you? That person that you've been witnessing, that person you've been trying to help, that person, that person that you led to the Lord and disciple, what are they going to think when you quit? When you give up the ghost, when you when you say, I'm done with this, and I'm throwing in the towel, I don't want any part of this anymore, what's going to happen to them? More importantly, what effect will that have on people within your family? Within your friend base. I know preachers that have been a long bad. They started out great, they're, they're doing a great job, and all that, and all of a sudden something happens and, and they fall into a moral sin. When you go back, I mean, I, I can give you names of some preachers that I know that failed, and you cannot find their kids and their grandkids. Why? Because they didn't think it important enough to keep the world strong. They didn't think it important enough to keep the fight with God. They didn't think it important enough. And, and, and the lives that were destroyed by one man's failure. That's one thing that needs to be done. Knowing that I've got family, I know I've got friends, knowing that I've, there, there are acquaintances out there that need to be saved. And if I give up, they're going to say, it doesn't work. I just won't give up too. If he can't do it, if she can't do it, there's no way I can do it. You see, it's an immediate work, it's an active work, and it's a when God calls you, it's always true. Sometimes we get discouraged. I talk to people all the time. Preacher, I'm just so tired. I've even had a voice to say I'm angry at God. Think of the folks that you will destroy by your name. Because those times in our lives are very few, far between. But when we give up, we cast in the power, we, we give it up, it's, it's time. And people see that, and people understand that, and people go, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do that. Let me ask you. We talked about this morning making excuses. I got all kinds of excuses for it. Not serving God. Man, 
if, if, if you don't have an excuse, all you gotta do is wait around the devil and give you give it to you. Man, I'm tired. This morning I got off at I'm supposed to get off at seven. Worked all night long from eleven to seven this morning. And my coworker didn't show up. So I didn't get home until 7.30. So I didn't get my nap. I didn't get the church. I was tired. And then, I always come over and finish writing out my notes, and I didn't get a chance to do that. The message this morning was outlined in my Bible, thankfully. I told Miss Deborah, I should go. And I said, I don't have any notes. <laughs> And I said, and I can't find the Bible that the notes are in. So I started coming through my Bible and I found the Bible the notes were in. And uh, thankfully, it, it just happened to be in this Bible. And the bulletin get, didn't get done. So I was praying in it. And it didn't get done this morning. So I had lots of things going on this morning. Because I had my mind I, I, I get off work here, I can sleep with them here, I can come over and do this, and this, and this. And that was just all shot this morning. I had a missionary come in. I had, uh, I had a gentleman come in and he, he was hurting. And he said, I can't talk. And he sat there and talked. I could have said, nah, you're going to talk. I got, I, got, I got things to do. You can spend it away. But no. I spent that time. I said, Lord, you're just going to have to help. We can have, you know, there's a lot of people that would have gotten off except for this morning and said, I'm just too tired. I'm going to church today. I'm not going to use them. I believe he gave him the job. I believe he knows. <laughs> His business is more important than mine. His business is more important than what I can accomplish in myself. He has to be in it to work with we need to be active in the ministry. We're soldiers of the cross of Christ. And soldiers, regardless of how tired they are, when the battle starts, they gotta get up and go. You know, Revelry starts real early in the morning. Right, Brother Tom? Mm -hmm. Right, Brother Doug? Early in the morning that Revelry sound. I didn't get much sleep. Well, <laughs> Sergeant doesn't really care about that. Right. It's time to go. I said, it's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go. Lord's coming back one day. I don't know the day or the hour. But I do know he's coming. Signs are getting closer and closer and closer. We don't have time to give up. We don't have time to play around. We thank you for the truth of the word of God. Lord, hand in hand, with excuses, excuses, excuses. Lord, uh, being a ready disciple, being ready to, to follow you in all things that we do. Lord, we need to be active. Lord, we need to be active. When you call, it needs to be an immediate response. It needs to be an active response. It needs to be a perfect, a perfect response. We need to be busy about your work. Give us, Lord, the strength that we need. The strength to help in the times of weakness. And the strength to continue on when we're tired and when we're hurting. And when all things are failing, Lord, we, we just need that. Live and encourage me and strengthen me. Father, I pray for our church. I pray, Father, for our people. Lord, help us to be active. Help us to, uh, to continue, Lord, in the, in the work of the ministry. Every single one of us has, a, has an influence somewhere, ha, ha, has a contact, Lord, that needs Christ, has a, uh, a person that's hurting that just needs uh, a sympathetic ear and a, and, and a, and a person that would uh, voluntarily pray and encourage and strength. Lord, I pray that you bless the invitation tonight. Let's in Jesus' name we pray. Let our heads bow and our eyes closed and no one looking around.
God deals with your heart tonight.